Okay, welcome everyone. And, and today we are very happy to have Noam Elkies here speaking on rank speculation. Thank you. Are you, are you going to ask me about recording? Oh, this yes, um, and I forgot. Um, Noam, is it okay? Do we have your permission to put this video on YouTube afterwards? Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you to uh, Drew and Rachel for organizing this uh, seminar in a time of Zoom and for inviting me to give one of the talks here. Thanks also to Bjorn Poonen for giving a wonderful talk two weeks ago that included some material that I don't, that I, that I won't be covering today because I just included by reference. And uh, <coughs> yes, uh, the rank in the title uh, is mostly a noun referring to the rank of elliptic curves, but some of the heuristics are more speculative than, ad than others, which may make rank sometimes applicable as a, an adjective as well. Uh, at any rate, uh, so an overview, I'll briefly review the Mordell Vey theorem, although the part we'll use is Mordell's theorem and Mazur's torsion theorem, and then indicate how that gives naturally to various questions about the ranks of elliptic curves. Um, the second bullet there is what I am going to partly refer to uh, Bjorn Poonen's talk, but I will add a few other heuristics that he didn't mention, heuristics and observations. Um, give a warning about the analogous but structurally rather different question concerning uniformity of Mordell Vey versus Mordell Faltings. Uh, and then give some indication about how we look for curves or more precisely families of curves of large rank, taking both the algebraic and the identity approach and the algebraic geometry approach. And finally, uh, give a rough dimension count, which turns out to be also supported by some K3 theory, that happens to give another route to exactly the same bounds, uh, but differing in many details, and uh, again, giving only very, you know, speculative support to the notion that there should be a bound of 21. So, um, it won't let me go on. Now it let me go on. So, this story goes back at least a hundred years. I mean, special cases of this theorem go back all the way to Fermat, but the general case was proved by Mordell in 1920, showing that for any elliptic curve E over Q, the group of rational points has an abelian group structure, and it's a finitely generated group. Even the fact that it has a finite group, an abelian group structure wasn't really completely stated until Model or a bit before that. There is a nice paper by uh, Norbert Schacher on the development of the law of the group law of an elliptic curve, but that's a different discussion. It's been a hundred years, one way or the other. Uh, this is usually known as the Model Vey theorem because uh, about eight years later, Vey generalized it from an elliptic curve over Q to replacing Q by an arbitrary number field, K and finite extension of Q, and replacing A, the elliptic curve E, by an arbitrary B in variety. That's what ABVAR stands for. Whoa, how did that happen? Uh, sorry. Ah, that's what ABVAR stands for here. And finally generate the B in group is the same thing as a finite group, which is a group of torsion elements, direct sum with Z to the R, and the Z to the R part of it is, of course, not canonical, but in general, but the rank of it is, and the, the number R, the number of independent generators mod torsion, and that's what we call the rank of the elliptic curve, or sometimes the arithmetic rank, because there are Bertrand's three and there gives another interpretation of it, but it's still conjectural, so rank for us would mean arithmetic rank, and over Q, because we are not in this talk worrying about what happens when you vary the number field in 6e. So, uh, 
So there is an actual question. You have an infant family of elliptic curves, an infant correction of elliptic curve. Just look at all possible fast stress equations. Uh, they give rise to find a generated group. Which groups arise? Or equivalently, which ordered pairs of a torsion group and some non-negative integer r are possible? So uh, there was a key uh, result in this direction by uh, Barry Mazur by now, well, more than 40 years ago. Still a very, you know, not an easy result. Uh, showing exactly which torsion groups arise. The list seems to be a bit strange. Uh, it's explained in part by the fact that already over the real numbers, any finite group in the, elliptic, in the group of an elliptic curve has to be either cyclic or zima two direct some cyclic. And which cyclic groups occur, they're precisely the ones for which the moduli curve is rational. And so you can write the, the general elliptic curve with a five torsion point or with both a two four torsion and a six torsion point. And apparently that happens for 11 cyclic groups, the ones of order 10, or excuse me, up to 10 or 12 or the way I wrote it here, all the numbers up to 12 except for 11. For 11, the modular curve is genus one curve. It has only five rational points and all of them are degenerate. So there's no elliptic curve in 11 torsion over Q. Or it can be Z mod 2 directs some Z mod 2, Z mod 4, Z mod 6, or Z mod 8. So each one of these groups arises because you can write down explicit formulas. And then the question becomes, um, question becomes, which, given the torsion group, which possible ranks, what ranks are possible? And in particular, the set of R's that arise, finite, or equivalently is the rank bounded. Is there some uniform bound that applies to all elliptic curves over Q. And then it splits into sub-questions depending on whether you believe it's bounded or not. If it's unbounded, how far do you have to look before you find the first curve of rank R? If it's bounded, well, what's the bound? And if it so happens that, you know, the, the largest possible rank is, I don't know, 50, are there infinitely many curves of rank 50? Or maybe it's actually there is a finite number of curves of even higher rank, but there is some limbs up. So what's the largest R that arises infinitely open? Or even infinitely often, excuse me. Oh, why is this going back? Oh, I see. Uh, and so we asked this for 15 families of elliptic curves. All elliptic curves, curves with a two torsion point, curves with two times six, etc. There are other natural elliptic curve families for which you can ask that as long as they're infinite and they're not forced to have bounded rank for some other reason. So, for example, a famous case of the congruent number problem, d times y squared equals x cubed minus x, or if you prefer, y squared is x cubed minus d squared x. These are the elliptic curves that parameterize, uh, well, various things. They are three-term arithmetic progressions of rational squares with common difference d. They are rational right triangles with area d. There are quadratic twists of the curve y squared equals x cubed minus x, which arose in Fermat's proof of the n equals 4 case of Fermat's last theorem. Um, you can ask the same question for quadratic twists of another curve. So instead of x cubed minus x, take some other cubic that has no repeated roots and ask for its value to be d times the square. Uh, similarly, the curve that arrives in the famous Ramanujan anecdote about 1729 the curves that describe writing a given number t as a sum of two cubes. These are some of the elliptic curves of j equals zero. You can ask for the Mordell curve, which are the general curves of rank of j, of j zero, with j equals zero, which are uh, sectic twists, the family of sectic twists, and the other kind of twists that arrive are the quartic twists for the j equals 1728 curve, which are also a special case of the family which has torsion Z mod 2. So you have a series of these equations, uh, of these families, excuse me. For each one of them, you can ask the question. And basically, for each one of them, the question is still hopeless. And the best we can do is try to have various ways to guess at the answer. 
like what happens for small curves, how big a rank can we find, uh, what do analogous questions come, uh, what happens for analogous questions for which we know the answer. So uh, some of these were already uh, described by Bjorn Polin last week, so to add a couple more, um, oh, I thought I was going to say uh, that I'm going to include, ah, here it is, sorry. I skipped over that page. Uh, so the conjectures range from like pure speculation, oh, it feels to me like, oh, the rank might be bounded, oh no, there's no way you can find more hundred and ten points, to things that are more connected to uh, you know, actual quantitative models. Sometimes they give actual numbers like, you know, maybe this upper bound of 21, or maybe, well, here's a lower bound on how far you have to look before you'll find the rank 21 curve, etc. Oh, I see that there is a, uh, there is a typo here. So as I said, Bjorn mentioned a few of them, including the fact that in the function field analog, the, num the rank is in fact unbounded, and that should be Chaferevich and Tate. Uh, Almer gave another version, well, another family which is not a twist family, although it still relies on very specific characteristic P behavior. Um, <clears throat> and I'll add a, a few more to this list. So what do you get from actual tables? What do you get from bounds that you can prove in the conductor? And a counting heuristic, which I haven't seen published before. I mean, I've been, you know, playing with this for about 20 years, but it's, you know, it's not the kind of thing that one can really put in a paper. Um, so we have been tabulating elliptic curves since actually before Mather's theorem. So uh, there's computation of Tingley et al. that uh, ended up in a well-thumbed uh, issue of lecture notes in mathematics. Um, 476, I don't see it here, it's also known as the Antwerp tables because that's where that meeting took place. Um, in another I couldn't find this picture in my files, but in another talk I show the picture of the actual volume of lecture notes in math in our library, which has 476 bound together with three other L&M theories. And you can very clearly see that the side of the, uh, that, the, the, that the side of the uh, volume that contains the Antwerp tables is almost black because people have been thumbing through that particular list of curves for many years uh, until we had more modern tables of, you know, Cremona and then the LMFDB tables. But in that original list, he computed all modular curves, or modular elliptic curves of conductor up to 200. And there are hundreds of those. Even when you mod out by Sogenes, they're 281, if I can trust the LMFDB count, which of course I do. And all of them have rank 0 or 1. They're 206 zeros, they're 75 ones, but there's not a single curve of rank two or more. Ah, what happened here? Sorry, um, I'm not navigating this well. Shh, there we go. They all have rank zero or one. And, okay, so that was back in 76. We now have better algorithms and much faster computers and many more computers, so we have gone up to half a million, and the computations are ongoing. And we do see ranks larger than zero and one, but they arrive slowly. So there are by now three million curves in the tables. Um, fewer than 9,000 of them, that's like one in 300 or something like that, have rank three, and there's only one curve of rank four. Curiously, that conductor also has two other curves, both of which have rank three. But, uh, so it takes a while before uh, you even see a fir the first curve of large rank. Why does it keep going backwards? I'm sorry. Um, I'll do it this way. Ah, okay. So, um, <clears throat> turns out that there's good reason for that. So Mestre, about 10 years afterwards, proved that you have an exponential lower bound on the conductor of an elliptic curve which has rank R. The conductor is a measure of how complicated a curve is. It it's 
smaller than the discriminant, but contains all of the uh, prime factor of the discriminant. Uh, this is an, a conditional bound that assumes at least the virtual friend and our con, uh, conjecture. And I think he assumed GRH as well, although there is a version of it with a weaker exponential growth that doesn't require GRH. And it's a trick that Odlivko had introduced a decade before in the context of discriminant bounds on number fields. So if you give me a number field, it's a long-standing question how small can the discriminant get given the degree and how the degree is split between real and complex embeddings. Um, there are bounds going back to Minkowski. And curiously, the best bounds that we have, even not assuming GRH, are to look at the functional equation for the zeta function as a formula for the discriminant, or rather for the absolute value of the discriminant. And there is a similar formula for the L function of an elliptic curve. At the time, we had to say of a modular elliptic curve, but now we have this wonderful modularity theorem. And the conductor of the curve occurs in there, and you can think of that as a formula for the conductor and optimize what values of S you evaluate this at and how you combine those to get the best bounds possible. And for example, even without any hypothesis on the rank, you find that the conductor has to be at least 10. And in fact, there are no curves of conductor less than, less than or equal 10, but there is a curve conductor 11, just one up to isogeny. If you require the rank be at least one, and therefore that there is conjecturally a simple zero at f equals one, that lets you get a better bound on the conductor, and it turns out to be bigger than 36. And in fact, there's a curve conductor 37. You do it for r equals two, and you find a bound that's bigger than the thing they bound beyond 200. It's not as sharp. The first conductor two curve occurs at 389, but it still explains, it's roughly of the same si right size, and it still explains why we haven't found any curves of rank 0, 1 in the original tables, and why there are no curves of rank 10, let's say, even in the current LMFDB tables. So, in general, Mestre shows that R, well, either R is bounded by some art proof of the logarithm, or equivalently, the conductor has to grow exponentially in R. So that's one lower bound. Another one is to say, if you have, your, if you have a curve with non-trivial torsion, that actually forces its rank to be even of smaller order than log of n sub e. Just to remind you, uh, at least for, uh, in the case of two torsion, a curve with a two torsion point, you put the point at the origin, you get it in the form y squared equals x cubed plus something plus a4x. So it's a cubic with a root at x equals zero. And then, going all the way back to Fermat, we know that x has to be a square times an s unit where s is basically the prime that divide a4. So up to squares, x moves in a finite group. But that, that group is exactly what you see when you do a two descent, between, or rather an isogeny descent, between this curve and the isogenous curve uh, related by a two isogeny. So if you have, a, if x, so you have a, actually a map taking any point to x mod square, the kernel is the point that come from E prime. Then you can repeat the argument for E prime, except instead of A4, we have this other factor of the discriminant. And that gives you a bound for E mod 2E. Once you have a bound on E mod 2E, that's to the power of the rank plus one, at least assuming that there is no further torsion. And that gives you an upper bound on the rank, which if you work it out, is essentially the number of primes. So they have to be at least R primes. And for the conductor to have R primes in it, it has to have size at least x of the sum of the logs of the first r primes, which grows like r log r. So that gives us a super exponential bound on n or a sub logarithmic upper bound on the rank. Works much the same yeah. way for, yeah, question. Uh, there was one question about the previous slide about whether there were any bounds of this sort which don't assume GRH or BSD of, MEST, of the sort of MEST. Um, the question, so the question is, are there, so I, Messler assuming BSD and GRH. Mm -hmm. um, 
so GRH is, I believe, not necessary. You still get exponential growth, but uh, just with the worst constant. That's at least what happens for number fields. But you absolutely do need BSD because uh, the bound uses the multiplicity of the root at s equals 1. Of course, if you find a curve that doesn't, doesn't obey BSD, uh, there are more things at stake than, uh, than, than just this bound. <laughs> um, other questions? Well, yeah, and, uh, somebody suggested in, if you went in full screen mode, it might be a little easier to advance the slides, but I don't know. Thank if you. I'll try that. Uh, um, I am trying that, but I'm not succeeding. Uh, let's see, file, uh, view, full screen mode, or control L. Thank you. Okay. So it works similarly for other torsion, for other non-trivial uh, torsion. No, it doesn't. Sorry. We can't see right now. Oh, you cannot see it at all. No. Sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Okay. Um, resume share. Does that work? Okay. Maybe I should not try to. Uh, you're not able to see any of this now. Well, that didn't help. Well, sorry about that. Stop share. And do I need to share again, maybe? Will that work? Yeah. yeah. yeah um, OK, let me try that. How is that? Can you see now? Oh, yeah, that's great. Yes, much better. Yeah. OK. Except now I can't go, now I can't go back and forth. OK. <laughs> I, can, I can, oh, I can. OK, how did that happen? Sorry, back to the previous slide that I was on. Uh, there is this, okay, so now I can't highlight it, but there are curves of even of prime conductor and prime discriminant which have, well, not huge rank, but at least we have an example of rank 11. So that suggests that we are not going to see an effect that's as, you know, as simple as just the rank has to grow with the number of primes in a conductor. And that has to do with the fact that Without torsion, you have to worry about uh, the rank of the two and three torsion in class groups. And in fact, uh, for the curves, for these Mordell curves, that has to do with the two torsion in a pure cubic field and a three torsion in a pure quadratic, ex well, in a quadratic extension. And these are, in fact, the best ways that we know so far to get record two and three ranks for those kinds of class groups. But I digress. Um, something that's really speculative, but a bit, uh, a bit curious. Uh, remember that the rank also controls the number of rational points up to a given height. In fact, the number of rational points is proportional to log h to the power r over 2, basically because of the quadratic form interpretation of the canonical height. And in fact, the, the, the constant that occurs there involves the same factor well, there is VR, which just has to do with the volume of a sphere, but there is the number of torsion points divided by the square root of the regulator, which is essentially one of the factors in BSD, to some other power. On the other hand, how many points do we expect? If you give me a random curve and you give a, take a random point m over n, you have some quartic polynomial that has to be a square, and the chance that the number x is a square is about 1 over the square root. And so you sum the square, 1 over the square roots of all these, and you get something that grows as log h. And yeah, n has to be a square, and so you gain some and lose some, but you still end up with an expected number of rational points of log h. Well, gee, if log h is the same as the r over second power of log h, then r equals 2. So in some sense, if this heuristic is worth, you know, is trustworthy even down to the log factors, then in some average, the rank of an elliptic curve should be 2. Or maybe it's not two, but there are, uh, but there are mostly zeros and ones, but there's enough curves of rank three to make up the difference, three or more. Uh, that for a while seemed plausible because if you looked at the graphs of ranks of, of uh, all tabulated curves or random curves up to some point, it started out at one half you know, going up from zero to one half, and it seemed to be maybe trying all the way to reach one, 
for an average rank of cumin. Try to reach rank one, so maybe there would be some faster fraction of rank two curve, but apparently no. Uh, at least numerically, it's no longer plausible that the ra average rank even approaches one. And it's probably true that on average curves of rank zero or one, but who knows, maybe this is actually indicating either that there are lots of curves, of, many more curves of rank two than you'd think from the heuristic, or that for some reason, numbers of this special form, you know, quart homogeneous quartics with small coefficients are less likely to be a square by some log factor than random numbers of that size. Okay, so I think this is the rankest speculation today. Uh, there's a misleading analogy with the uniform, uh, uniformity of Mordell faultings. So remember that Mordell has a famous theorem, which is not a Mordell of a theorem, but also a famous conjecture, which is not a theorem of faultings. Theorem I, I mentioned before, conjecture, if, if you have a curve genus bigger than one, the number of points is finite. And again, originally over Q, but now over any number field. So then the question is, if it's finite, can it get arbitrarily big? Well, yes, but only if you increase g. So if you fix some g, 2, 3, 4, etc., if there's some uniform b sub g, finite, such as every curve of genus g has at most b rational points. So those seem very similar questions, and if you look at the record hunting techniques, they're very similar. So I'm going to say a bit about K3 surfaces before, and they're used for finding uh, curves of high rank. There are also K3 surfaces in models like you can see in my screenshot, uh, which is a quartic curve, has a few dozen nines, take a random quartic, a random plane section of it, you'll get a quartic curve with that many rational points. Um, but, in fact, and that, that applies to both the max and the limb subversion, you have the same techniques, the same people holding some of the records, but uh, even though both conjectures are open, I don't think there is any question about what's the right answer for Mordell Fartings. And there the right answer is uniform boundedness is almost certainly true. Any kind of, uh, what do you call it, or any reasonable heuristic would, take, would show you that. Um, and in fact, there's a theorem due to Caprava harris mazur that if you believe the bombieri lang conjectures on rational points on varieties of general type, which is a natural analog of Mordell to higher dimensional varieties, then there is a bound. Uh, they start by showing that there is some bound B prime, such that if you look at all curves of genus G that have B prime rational points, that's a variety of general type which means it's so complicated that we expect that you can't find rational points randomly. They have to be concentrated on some proper sub-variety, and then you can start a big induction going and get the existence of some uniform upper bound bigger than B prime, unfortunately ineffective, but still some bound, is some uniform bound. And there cannot be any such path for uniform or derve, because for any R, the variety e to the r is not of general type. There is no algebraic condition on all r tuples of rational points on an elliptic curve as soon as the curve has rank one. They are dense and even in the real locus. Well, assuming that r, that there, that if there are two real components, there is a point in, in the in the bounded in, in the second locus. At any rate, so this is a misleading conjecture, even though many of the same tools apply to uh, record hunting for both of them. Okay. So, how do we find curves of high rank? By the way, because I have opened, because I've made this the entire screen, I can't see the clock. So what time is it? It's 11.30. 11.30, okay, great. I'm about halfway. So, how do you know there are lots of curves even of rank one? Well, that's easy. You just look at the equation of a general elliptic curve and say, I want to point at some x1, y1. Just choose your favorite A and solve for B. And for most choices, that will give you not just a curve with a rational point, it will give you an elliptic curve. It is to say, this cubic x, cubic x plus b will be 
will ha will not have repeated roots, right? Because that's there, there is a uh, there is one there is an algebraic condition for the discriminant to be zero, and it will not be a torsion point. That's very easy thanks to Mazur because that's also a finite number of algebraic conditions. But even without Mazur, um, <coughs> sorry, even without Mazur, uh, it's not hard to show it's usually almost never a torsion point. Okay, supposing I want two points. Well, uh, remember the, the old joke about if you want a straight line fit, never take more than two data points? Well, we can still take two data points, and we have a straight line fit between y squared minus x cubed and ax plus b. So we can solve simultaneous linear equations for a and b that make the curve run through both x1, y1, and x2, y2. And again, usually these points are not just non-torsion, but are independent of each other. I'll say more about that later. In fact, you can easily get three points, because you might as well do not put the cubic in narrow vice stress point, and then at the end, translate by a2 over 3 once you have your curve with three points on it. Why stop there? We can go to the completely general form that has five coefficients, so we can throw five points on the board and find a curve that goes through them. Or for that matter, there's no reason for the x cubed and y squared coefficients to be one. You only get six and not seven because, you know, once you put a coefficient in front of x cubed, the whole thing becomes homogeneous. And so you don't actually gain anything, but you can get six this way. And so far, what we have been doing is basically what's sometimes known as the Texas sharpshooter uh, joke which is, I mean, I, th I think I first heard of it in the context of some military recruiter in Russia, and there is this barn that has a bunch of bullseyes on it and an arrow straight through the, straight in the bullseye of each one. And the bullseyes are not in some normal pattern, but still seems quite impressive until the recruiter inquires and finds that, uh, in fact, what the purported sharpshooter or marksman had been doing was shooting a bunch of arrows at the side of a barn and then drawing a perfect bullseye around each one. So you can only do this so many times, but we are not out of arrows yet because we can take an arbitrary plane cubic to nine random points. And that gives you an elliptic curve, once you choose one of them as the origin, with well, you might think eight points because one of them has made the origin, but in fact, you can use the uh, you can use the line through any two of them to find a ninth point, and those really are independent. And there, it might seem to stop. And if you had done this for a plane quartic, you would be able to run fourteen points through a quartic, and then it would stop. But here, it only stops part way. That is to say. So far, we have basically shown that elliptic curves with nine rational points are rationally parameterized. Because you can take any four points in uh, P2, make them your favorite four, four points, like the unit vectors in 1, 1, 1, and then take five more points, and that gives you 10 parameters for a curve. Uh, you cannot do it beyond R equals 9, even if you're more clever than this, because, in fact, for R equals 10, the variety is known not to be rational. There are various ways of saying it. H11, 0 is positive. If you count points, you actually get an amazing appearance of the Ramanujan function tau of p, which, of course, is not polynomial, whereas elliptic curves with nine points, the total number of points, and the, the, the average rank, excuse me, the average trace of an elliptic curve to the power nine is still a polynomial. But we don't have to parameterize all elliptic curves with 10 or 11 or 28 points. We just have to find some infinite family. And Neron already found a way to restrict the nine-point collections so that you can find a 10th and even an 11th independent point. And at this point, no pun intended, you might be asking, if you haven't thought about this already, how do we know that these points are actually independent? And, well, sometimes they aren't, if you chose your points particularly, uh, you know, with, with, with particular bad luck. 
but it's enough to show that they are generically independent. That is to say that there is no single relation that holds for all of them. And you can check that in various ways, like checking the canonical height, pairing is non-trivial, is non-degenerate, or checking that various things don't behave badly under uh, specialization, etc. And then there are theorems that say if you're over a number field, then as soon as there is a large family with no generic relation, then in fact most choices yield independent rational points. And, in, and moreover, that, that gives actually infinitely many distinct curves. So Neron proved the first one of these, showing that the exceptional set is thin in some sense. You know, let's say at least 99% of points are, uh, you know, will have remaining nines you want, give you independent uh, specializations, excuse me, give you independent points. And then Silverman, uh, using the heights, showed that if you have a one-dimensional family, the exceptional set is actually finite. So in fact, past a certain point, you will always get our independent points over Q, let's say, if you, or any other number field, if you started with a generically independent family. So that gives us a general strategy. Find some curve E over Q of T, which is non-constant. Find our independent points, and then you have not just one elliptic curve of rank R, you have infinitely many curves of rank R, and if your initial curve had torsion group G, then the same is true for each one of the specializations, and so you get a limb sub of at least R for the rank. And having done that, we can then search for particular specializations that make the rank even larger. Or you can try searching for base changes, where you make T itself a rational function of some U that adds more rational points. And that's basically the overall strategy for rank records now for the past several decades. So hunt around for families with large rank, and then hunt around for specializations, either you know, specializations of this kind or just taking T to be a rational number for which you can find more points. And uh, at ANTS a few months ago, uh, Zev Kratzberg and I presented uh, some, <clears throat> the, the latest advance in that direction of hunting for specializations. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that here. Um, but I will give a bit more indication of where these families come from. Um, again, the same, similar thing is true for more than far things. And there the specialization theorem is much easier. You just need to make sure the points don't coincide, which of course they don't uh, if they don't, for for most T if they don't generically. Um, unfortunately, uh, if you are hunting for, uh, more, for large numbers of points on a curve of genus two or more this way, you have more or less conceded that Caparazzo, Harris, Mazur are right. In other words, that the rank is bounded. Because basically you're looking for families. You're looking for sub-varieties of the variety of, of curves of genus G with R points on them and then sub-varieties of that in which you get extra points, and by induction, eventually you run out of dimension. So this is a, can be a good way to find records, and in fact, I and colleagues have several such records, but it's not going to get the rank to be, un, it's not going to get a number of points to be unbounded. Whereas for elliptic curves, we do not have any, I don't think we have any strong reason to expect one way or the other whether the rank of an ellipt non constant curve, an elliptic curve over Q of T, is bounded or not. And from what I've said so far, if it's unbounded, that means that the original question about ranks of curves over Q also gives rise to unbounded ranks. So it's very much an open question for elliptic curves. Okay. So finally, there are two ways of thinking about finding such a family. One is that you're just trying to be clever and find algebraic identity. Because we are basically looking for algebraic identity saying you have some rational functions A of T and B of T, which make the, this an elliptic curve with non-zero discriminant. And you have some rational functions X sub i and Y sub i, I ranging from 1 to R, such that 
this equation is satisfied in the field of rational functions of t, and the equation and the points are not generically, uh, uh, and the points are generically independent. Or you can think about it as you have a family of elliptic curves over parameterized by p1, parameterized by t, and a family of elliptic curves, one per t, makes a surface, right? I mean, if you ignore the x sub i and just say x, y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, that's one equation, but now it's an equation in three variables, y, x, and t. So it's a surface, and it's a surface that comes with a map to p1, namely t, such that the preimage of any t is an elliptic curve. And, well, a generic t is an elliptic curve. And likewise, if you also impose, it should have a non-trivial -tor non torsion group. So, for example, instead of this form, you have the form x cubed plus ax squared plus bx that we showed before for two torsion, or this for three torsion, etc. for others. Um, and likewise, if you have curves with more than one parameter, if you have n parameters, it's an n plus one dimensional elliptic variety. So there's a standard picture cartoon that goes with that. Here is your elliptic surface. Uh, there is a map T to P1. The generic fiber is an elliptic curve. So here is the T1 curve, the T2 curve, the T3 curve. A rational point is a map that goes the other way. Given T, it finds a point on the corresponding curve E sub T. So it's a one-sided inverse. And there is a zero section that takes each T to the Zero to the, uh, you know, to the identity at each t, and then any other point gives you some section, and there are some fibers that are going to be degenerate. They might be a cusp or a node, or it might even be decomposable as, in this case, a d4 or i0 star fiber. Um, and then you can try using the algebraic geometry of surfaces. So, for example, you can use intersection theory to check whether, to compute the height pairing and therefore check whether a bunch of sections are independent. Or you can have some surface that you got some other way and try to make it an elliptic surface with high rank. So that's what I was saying here, intersection theory, moduli of surfaces, etc. Neuron's original approach was basically geometric. So I presented it in terms of nine points on P2, but if you fix eight of them, you get what's called a rational elliptic surface, y squared equals x cubed plus x plus b, where a and b are polynomials of degree four and six. Uh, for several decades afterwards, uh, the ball went into the algebraic court, and there are various clever constructions by people like Mestre that were looking for identities often with some additional symmetry, and got the rank eventually up to 14. And now we are back in the algebraic geometry, or excuse me, arithmetic geometry court, because uh, we are using the geometry of elliptic K3 surfaces, which are the next step where A and B have degree 8 and 12. You might wonder why not 6 and 9, but there are problems at infinity if you have any numbers that are not 4K and 6K. Uh, and so, for example, if G is trivial, the current record is you can find an elliptic K3 surface of rank 17. Well, apparently it's not easy to find, but I found one of these about 14 years ago. And then you can do some quadratic base changes to get the rank up to 18 over some other curve. And you can combine two of these quadratic base changes to get an elliptic curve of positive rank and a family of elliptic curves parameterized by it that have rank 19. And that's the current record that we have for an infinite family of elliptic curves, over Q. 19 is rather suggestively close to 20 or 21, which are the current guesses for the upper bound uh, under the uh, Park, Poon, and Voigtwood uh, heuristic. And in fact, that 19 should really be 20 because I mean, this is conjecture, but it's a very well-grounded conjecture, namely that half of these curves should have sine plus one, and once it has sine plus one and they have 19 independent points, somewhere out there, there should be a 20th one. So in fact, there should be infinitely many curves of rank 20 in this, at least 20 in this family, and likewise for all the other examples that 
families that I mentioned. And that's actually for, well, if not good reason, but at least for some consistent reason. It is say it works the same way for most of the other groups in Mazur's list, all the ones that can be accommodated on elliptic K3 surface, which is all of them except the biggest four, 9, 10, and 12 in the cyclic case, and the biggest one, 2 plus 8 in a non-cyclic case. I'm sure I don't have enough time to start developing the picture of K3 surfaces, so I'm just going to count parameters. Uh, but for K3 surfaces, there are these amazing theorems, like the two-sided K3 Torelli theorem, that tell you that all of these heuristic parameter counts that can go wildly wrong for more complicated surfaces are actual theorems. So, how many parameters do you have for an elliptic K3 surface? Well, A has degree 8, B has degree 12, so that's nine coefficients, running from t to, to the power 0 up to t to the power 8, for A, 13 for B, so you might think 22. But you can still scale X and Y, so that gives you one parameter. And what's more, you can change T around. You can translate T, that gives you an equivalent surface, and you can take T goes to 1 over T and multiply by T to the fourth, and then you can combine those two, and eventually you end up with all the projective linear transformations of P1, of which there are three-dimensional groups. So you have to subtract one for this scaling and three for projective linear transformations and do your arithmetic correctly, or at least write your arithmetic correctly. It should be 22 minus three minus one, and I'll fix this uh, before submitting a more final version of the, uh, of the slides. So 22 minus three minus one is in fact 18 parameters. And that's almost what we found, remember. We found that you can have, excuse me, I haven't gotten it yet. It's 18 parameters. Um, okay, so supposing I have a, rash, have a rational point, which is of the simplest kind possible. X and Y are polynomials. You can do the same analysis for rational sections. Uh, I mean, sections where X and T have denominators. It's more complicated, but the final count comes out to be the same. So now you have five coefficients for X and seven coefficients for Y, but you have an equation between degree 12 polynomials so that's 13 conditions. So you've added 12 variables, but you have taken away 13 equations. So you have, in total, when you eliminate, you expect one condition or 18 parameters. So 17-dimensional family of K3s, elliptic K3s with, with the simplest kind of rational point. And then you can add another rational point. That takes away another parameter. Do it again, do it again, until you run out of dimensions. And so expect to be able to get up to rank 18 this way. And in fact, you can over the, ra over the rational, not over the rational numbers, but over some other number fields. So how many elliptic curves of rank 18 will that give us? Well, you can choose T of height up to H. That's H squared choices. Each one of them has an, gives an elliptic curve rank 18. So the discriminant is H to the 24th. And about half of them have sine minus 1. So we expect h squared curves of rank at least 19 up to discriminant h to the 24th. And that's exactly what PPVW gives us. And they also suggest that if you just take them randomly, half the, you know, there's about one of them will have, well, about h of them will have one more generator and about one of them will have two more generators. And in fact, you can expect to get that by base changes. So if instead of x squared cube plus x plus b being a square, it's almost a square, so it's a, fifth, so it's a square of some quintic times some random quadratic, that's one fewer condition. So you expect to be able to do that, but then to get a rational point, you have to make that quadratic a square. Well, that's a conic. Conics are rational, so you have a quadratic extension where you take T and S being some rational functions of U, and then instead of H squared choices, you will have H choices, but the rank will be one more. You do it a second time, you get two quadratic independent, extension, independent quadratic extensions, you combine them, you get an elliptic curve of positive rank, at least some of the time it will be a positive rank, let's say rank rho, and so you'll get some power of log H curves with 20 points, and then half the time the sign will give you a 21st point. So we've reached exactly 21. 
and likewise for each one of the other non-trivial torsion groups. So for example, if you have two torsion, then instead of A and B having degrees 8 and 12, they have degrees 4 and 8. So you have 4 plus 8 instead of 8 plus 12 coefficients. The total, the, everything else works the same, so you now expect the rank to be 8 less, so the maximum should be 13 with the rank 10 K3 family. And so far, I don't know of any example of this that works over Q, and I can prove that there is no, no example for rank 18 over Q, but for some other torsion groups like Zmod 4, it actually is possible. So we actually have a family of elliptic curves that should contain at least uh, curves of the same rank that put in et al. predict as the, excuse me, Park et al. comes further in that bit, uh, predicts should be, uh, <coughs> should, be uh, uh, should be attained infinitely often. And at ends, Zev, Kratzberg, and I described searching for curves that have much larger rank. Well, up to about 13, but that's another story. Uh, this is my last page. Um, so there are some caveats here. This looks like a very good match for the heuristics. On the other hand, these curves don't look anything like what the heuristics predict. So if I understand correctly, the heuristics say, okay, there's going to be a regulator of some power of h. I think it's h squared. And it should be roughly equally distributed among the generators. Whereas what we are getting here is we're getting r minus 1 generators that are tiny, whose canonical height is only some multiple of log h. And then the extra generator you get from the sign is huge. So you have a very uh, unbalanced lattice, uh, model V lattice of rational points. Um, over Q, we can't over always attain that. So I don't actually have a family of elliptic curves over Q, which I expect to meet the uh, PPVW bound, although I do have a family in which I was able to very successfully search for curves of, of rank as high as 28. Uh, and basically that happens because the arithmetic theory of K3 surfaces tells you that the height pairing, excuse me, the, the intersection pairing on the neuron severity group has to have discriminant at most this magic number 163. And 163 is large enough to get amazing examples like e to the power pi root 163 is almost an integer. It's unfortunately not large enough to get a lattice that would work for the Mortel Vey lattice here. And so I had to work much harder to get something of rank 17 instead of 18. And you might say, oh, okay, so we've gotten up from rank 8 or 10 or 11 up to rank 17 or 19 by going from a rational elliptic curves to K3 elliptic, rational elliptic surfaces to K3 elliptic surfaces. Maybe the next step will get even better. Well, not according to parameter counts, because if you have at the next level, each point imposes two conditions instead of just one. And so what you gain in parameters, you lose in the expected rank. On the other hand, Torelli-like theorems don't exist for elliptic surfaces beyond K3, and in fact, we know they can't exist. So the parameter counts might fail. And in fact, Bjorn described a construction by Shioda of a rank 68 surface over some number field. Uh, and even over Q, there are examples for torsion groups cyclic of order 8 and Z mod 2 cross Z mod 6 found by now at eight years ago, and there are more recent variations, for which their expected rank is one more than you would predict. So if you assume that ranks are, excuse me, that signs are equally plus one and minus one, which we'll hear about, I believe, in the next Vantage talk, then, in fact, we expect that there should be infinite families for which this is a torsion group, and the rank is one more than you would expect from these random matrix style heuristics. So that's all I have. And uh, I guess, thank you. And if there are any questions from chat or otherwise, I'll try to answer them. Well, thanks, Noam. That was a wonderful talk.